Good morning. It was awesome to hear all of you singing today. See the hands up. Uh, amazing. We get to worship God together and uh, be reminded that uh, we're not crazy. We're not the only ones on planet Earth. We've got a whole bunch of us here that are still looking to Jesus as King and Kings of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. You know, before we get started today, uh, we have sort of a special announcement. You may not know this if you're not members of our church. We'd love you to become members and to, to discover what we're about, but we are an elder-governed church, a local elder-governed church. I am one of the elders, but we have 21 elders in, in all, and I'm under the authority of the eldership in general. And um, the way a person becomes an elder in our church is through years of, of ministering and caring and serving and living out a life of a Christ follower in our life group system and, and making disciples. And, and, and from time to time, um, the elders uh, will see people that we think are uh, proven uh, by their behavior, their families. We just, uh, we notice them, we go... Th uh, through a time of prayer, we, we reach out and ask uh, whoever that, that elder would be if they would be willing to go through a year of training with us. And if they uh, go through that year of training with us after uh, spending time with them and getting to know them and training them about what we're about and who we are, which we, we already know they're consistent with because of the way they've lived their life, we ask that man uh, to consider being an elder here at Real Life. And if they have the approval of the eldership and they, and, and they agree and, and their wife is uh, uh, understanding what that means, and then we, we bring them in front of the congregation. And we don't vote, but what we do is we uh, share with you who they are. And right now, the one that we're going to be sharing today, his name is Mike Wraith. That's his wife, Sandy. That's one of their daughters, Ashley. And... Uh, um, we say to you, if there is a biblical reason, if you're a member of our church and you, and, and, and you have a biblical reason why Mike Wraith should not be an elder of our church, we give you two weeks to let us know about that. And we don't look at any anonymous stuff. By the way, those of you who write anonymous letters, I wouldn't even know, uh, unless they're nice. They, they pass on nice stuff. But if it's not nice... If it doesn't have a name on it, it goes in the trash bin. No cowards allowed. And uh, um, if you have a biblical reason why Mike should not be an elder in our church, then we will deal with that. But if, um, if we don't have any biblical reasons come in, in two weeks' time, our elders will be here with Mike and Sandy, and Mike will be set aside as an elder of our church. So, we're letting you know we have next two weeks. If you have a biblical reason, um, we want to know what that is. Mike has been a blessing. Uh, he's a mental health professional. And believe me, our elders need a lot of mental health professionals. <laughs> so um, <laughs> he's been a huge help to training our staff on, on issues concerning mental health. And so it's just been great to have him as a part of our team. I'm going to pray and ask the Lord to uh, uh, open... Our eyes today as we dive into the Word, we're going to um, continue in our series called Lost in Translation, but uh, I know we can be here today, and it's uh, a, a holiday weekend, we can be thinking about what happened or where we're going to go next and, and miss that God has something for us today as we dive into His Word. I'm going to pray that I say nothing more or less than His Word clearly says. Will you bow your heads with me? Father, we just lift up this time to you. We're so grateful that you gave us your word as a light into our path. We know that man does not live by bread alone, by physical things, but by every word that proceeds from your mouth. And so we today declare that you are right, you are good, everything you say is for our good. Speak to us today, Lord. Guide me that I would say nothing more or less than your word says. In Jesus' name, amen. We are in Lost in Translation, and we've been looking at different words, biblical words, that have a biblical meaning, uh, as given by the Holy Spirit through human writers, the Scriptures. These words have been given to us, but what happens is our culture, our language, changes the definition of the words oftentimes. They, they keep the word like love, but they redefine the word as lust or attraction or feelings, 
And rather than being what God says love is, an act of the will, a choice to lay down your life for the other, love becomes about me and my feelings. So we keep the word, change the definition, and that word becomes meaningless or less than it was intended to be. And that greatly in, impacts our lives. When we get a word wrong, a concept wrong from Scripture, and allow the culture, the enemy, whoever, to change those definitions, not only does it create confusion, but every word in Scripture was given for our good. God knows we need it. Every command he's ever given us is given because he loves us and he wants to protect us. And uh, the devil likes to confuse words. But we come, in this church, we say, no, we're going to stick to God's word. We're going to press in. We're, we're going to say no to that and yes to him, and, and we'll be the better for it. And those of us who have decided to walk according to the word of God, their life has become stronger. Um, uh, we actually have a plan uh, written out for us, a map in a dark world, a light into our path, and, it, it, and ultimately, it leads to a, a, a more significant, important, strong, stable life in a crazy world of confusion and instability. And so we are diving into different words. This week, we're going to dive into this word friend, friendship. And I'm going to do something real quick. Um, I'm going to ask you in here, how many of you, and I want you to raise your hand, how many of you have a good friend? Raise your hand. All right, that's awesome. Now, I do this uh, when I go around the country and speak to pastors. I'll, uh, sometimes it's a bigger room than this. Sometimes it's smaller. But I'll often ask pastors, do you have a good friend? And just like in here, almost everybody raises their hand. But then what I do is I walk through and I explain what a good friend biblically is. And then at the end of the time, I ask them, do you have a good friend? And it goes from almost everybody to between 10 and 20% in the room of pastors. Now, how did this happen? How can they start out by saying, I have a friend, but at the end go, maybe I don't? Well, it's because, again, the word friend has come to mean a lot of different things in our culture. It might mean somebody that I have a common interest with and we have fun together, golfing or uh, hunting or playing basketball. Heaven help us. How can people do that? I don't know. <laughs> right? Um, we play cards together. Whatever. Uh, it, 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 so... In their mind, they start out with this idea of we have some fun with, with a friend. And so that's what it means. We enjoy each other's company, common interests, that kind of thing. So I have a friend. Is that what the Bible says friendship is? Is, is that it? Um, the kids today, if you were to ask, do I have a friend, what is a friend? They might tell you it's somebody who never tells on you, if, no matter what you do. They don't, in, the, in the way, the way that we, we said it, we don't snitch. That's old, I don't even know what the language is anymore. But that's what we, you don't, no, you're not, if you're loyal no matter what. Or I have a friend who backs my play no matter what. They're, they stick with me, doesn't matter what I do, it, that's a friend. And so, because they have that version of friendship, um, they, uh, they, they think they have to support their friends and their friends have to support them no matter what, meaning affirming what they're doing. And so, we, we have this word, we throw it around, we use it a lot, but what does it mean biblically? Now, I have to tell you that when uh, you have the wrong definition of a friend, uh, things can get ugly. Uh, you do uh, affirm your friend even when they do something that damages themselves. And so friendship was supposed to be one thing. It became something else. It didn't do what it was supposed to do. So somebody got hurt. You didn't tell, some, you know, what was going on in a kid's life, so they have a drug overdose. 
because you were a friend, you didn't tell anybody, and they become a drug addict, and you just went along with it. And now they're dead. Uh, you, you have a friend, kind of friendship where all you do is talk uh, about uh, football or fantasy football or whatever you're, you're doing, you know, and you don't really dive into the real stuff, and you, but you call that friendship, and, and so you don't call and talk to them when you're struggling, struggling you don't share anything. You, you, the friendship becomes less than it was supposed to, it's supposed to be, and it causes damage. And so, uh, here's what I want to say. We live in a culture that uh, is lonely. Lonely. But they have a ton of people around them, oftentimes. They, they have plenty of uh, busyness going on. Plenty of people around, typically, but, but they're lonely. And pastors, I, I think about pastors in particular, about 70% of pastors right now in America... Uh, according to Barnes poll, say that if they could find a job where they could make a living outside of ministry, they would leave ministry because it's a lonely life. They were actually even told in, in Bible college, don't be good friends with the people in your church because to be a leader, um, you, you have to appear to be strong all the time. You have to have it all together. And if you don't, if you, if you don't have it all together or people don't think you do, they won't listen to you. So keep a distance between you and the people in your church. That's what they're, they're actually told. Or they really would like to have a friend, but they don't because they're so busy putting out fires, dealing with issues all the time, that they don't have the ability to have friends around them, even though they might like to. They're lonely. And, um, and, and so they're living out either no friendship uh, or um, the wrong idea of friendship. And because spiritual maturity today has be become that you know the right information and you can do something like teach or do whatever, um, and and. and you know, we're kind of leaving out this love for God and love for others part of uh, maturity. Uh, friendship and, and relationship becomes more painful when you have the wrong version of it. When something's missing in it, it becomes less satisfying. It becomes more painful. You have, you have people that are claiming to be spiritually mature, but yet their ability to love, and, and remember, Jesus said, all the law and the commands hang on love God and love others. It's all about relationship, but when, uh, you know, dying to self and putting yourself over others all the time and, and, and becoming judgmental in, in a negative sense, I mean, you know, pride and picking out the faults of others, but yet I'm mature because I know something in the Word and I can do something, I can teach a class, or I know how to read my Bible, I, I must be mature. No, the fruit of the Spirit that God gives us and is evidence that we are being spiritually mature and growing in spiritual maturity is our ability to be in relationship. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love. Love for who? Well, love for God. Well, that's true. That's true. There are a lot of people out there that say, it's me and Jesus, and I don't really need anybody else because it's painful. It's distracting. And I want you to know that God doesn't even think only God is enough. You go, whoa, 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 that sounds almost heresy. No, go to the Garden of Eden. God and man are walking together. And God says, this is really good. And then he says, there's Something that's not good. It's not good for man to be alone. Man wasn't alone. Man had a relationship with God. God's saying, I made you for a relationship with me, Adam, but I also made you for a relationship with others. It's not good. You need others. That's how God made you, which is why all the law and the commands hang on love God and love others. And, and when we stop having friendship, when we stop having relationship, or we misdefine it, we're missing part of what God made us to have. And as we start to plug into Jesus again, 
And as we start, start a relationship and he starts pruning us and we're bearing fruit, spiritual fruit, love, joy, peace with who, patience towards who, kindness towards who, gentleness towards who. As he starts to shape us, we start to reconnect again. We, we're starting to get back with the devil caused us to lose because of sin. We, when we sinned, we sinned against God. That, 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 that Now Adam was hiding from God, but he wasn't just hiding from God. He actually put on garments to hide himself from his wife. Because of sin, it separated us here, it separated us here, and now God's doing a work in us, which is why it says in 1 Corinthians, or excuse me, uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, if we walk with Jesus, we have fellowship with one another. That word koinonia means deep, intimate relationship with one another. When you're walking in the Spirit, you're walking with Jesus, you start to reconnect. You start to have the ability to be in relationship with others. And, and that relationship has sort of pieces to it. There's a part of a recipe in it that God starts to inject back into it. It start, it, there are boundaries to it. There, there's a way to do it that the Scripture outlines for us. And God does a lot of work in Scripture telling us what relationship should look like and that we should be in it. Why? Because we were made for it. Like your body was made for water, your, your soul, your person was made for relationship with others. And so what the devil will do is he will do anything he can to separate you from God and from others. He's a divider. He's a murderer. He's a liar, deceiver, a distractor. He will do anything he can to get you away from what God made you to have. As Christ followers, we're to be known as a certain kind of people. In John 17, Jesus said, by this all men will know that you are my disciples, by your love for one another. That word love has a meaning, 1 Corinthians 13, 4. We'll come back to that in a minute. But I want you to get a picture here of what friendship is about. And again, as I said before, many of you may, uh, you didn't even mean to, but you may have adopted a form of Christianity that is not God's form. I tell people who fall into sin all the time, and usually there's a, a process they go through. They, they get disconnected. They uh, start letting the world dictate the terms, and it doesn't even have to be a bad thing. It can be a good thing, put in the wrong place. And pretty soon, they start drifting from spending time with the Lord and spending time with other believers. And now they've fallen in a hole, and it's a deep hole. And, and I'll say to them something along these lines. I couldn't live the form of Christianity you're living and not find myself in a similar hole. The kind of Christianity you're living leads to holes. Is the kind of friendship you're trying to live leading to a hole? Well, I want you to turn with me to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And uh, I, I want you to look at this passage. By the way, again, God gives us in his word what a friend looks like. Why? He wants us to have them. But he also wants us to be them. And so in a world that mystifies and... and, and and uh, creates a different form of friendship, we want to go back and go, all right, what is the biblical form of friendship? And I, I, I've written a couple books on this, and you, you, the hardest thing for me in a sermon like this is to fit this into uh, this amount of time, and so we're going to be here a while. No. Here's what it says. Um, by the way, Solomon is writing in Ecclesiastes, and he says a phrase throughout the entire book. Meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless under the sun. That's a depressing statement. This is a wealthy guy who had everything, and he decided to put aside God and just test everything in human terms. 
And so this book was written after he did that, and he comes up with meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless, and then he uses this phrase, and it's important, under the sun. Here's what he means by that. Take God out of the equation, live by the world's standards under the physical sun, S-U-N. Take God out of it, and you can have all that you want of it, but it will end up being meaningless. Now here's what he says. Again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. There was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. So he, had, he didn't have a family member. When he says brother, he doesn't necessarily mean a physical brother. He means a Jewish brother. He says he had neither friend nor brother. There was no end to his toil. He had a lot of work to do. Yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. So he's rich. He's gotten rich and he's had a lot of work to do. For whom am I toiling, he asks, and why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? The whole concept here is enjoyment comes from relationship with a friend or a brother. A, a relation, a son. He's got plenty of work to do, plenty of money. He's, got, he's wealthy, but he, he has no one to do life with. For whom am I toiling, he asks, and why am I depriving myself of, of, of relationship with others' enjoyment? I've got all this stuff. And then he says, this too is a meaningless, this too is meaningless and a miserable business. He, in, in a sense, what he's saying, this is depressing. This is the American Christian. Well, American in general. Plenty of work to do, plenty of money, but it's not enough. That's why we have the highest divorce rate, the highest addiction rate. It's just not enough. Highest suicide rate in the world, it's not enough. But we're, we've got plenty of work to do. I mean, we, we're, we we're start growing up, and when we're young, they say, what do you want to do when you grow up? That's the first question. And so now we can get you a career so you, have, you, you can really enjoy your work. And, and you've got, you got to be able to make money. So you have a family. You have all the toys. He says it's a miserable business. We're living that out. You may have plenty of stuff. You may have a, a, a been successful in work. But right now, the, uh, and I know I've shared this with you before, but the fastest growing suicide rate in the country is 50 to 54 white, middle class, educated men. They got plenty. They're educated. They have work. But it isn't enough. Oftentimes, they gave up the relationships to get those things, which means they now have those things but they don't have the things that matter most. He goes on. Now he's going to tell you, it, it, what is a good friend? What does a friend look like? Listen to what he says here. He says, this too is a miserable bit of business. And he says, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. Now I want you to notice first and foremost here, he says that uh, uh, they have a good return for their labor. In, in a sense, what he's saying is these people... Are, uh, uh, are working something uh, in their life, they're doing something in their life that is good, and they're getting a good return for it. Why? Well, because two fill each other in. Two lift each other up. Two fill in the gaps in perspective. Two, when they get across the finish line, they have, uh, they, they, they have something they've achieved together that they could not have achieved alone. And so he says later on, three are better than two. A lot of people want to use this as a marriage text. It's not a marriage text. This isn't the fundamentalist Mormon church. Uh, two are better than one. Three are better than two. And he says you get a better return. You, you're bound together. You're strong and, he, and he's making this point, and I think it's important. You get good work done 
with good people around you. The Bible's very clear that bad company corrupts good morals. He says right off the bat, you want a good friend, this is what you're looking for. Somebody that can work with you in a good direction where good return for labor can happen. The Bible is clear. It's an intentional process. He's laying out, this is what a good friend looks like so that you know. This is what a good friend does so this is something you can be. And he's, he's, he's saying, listen, be careful who you choose. It's not just any other friend, anybody that you can grab that will be, no, be intentional. This is an important thing for you to teach your kids. It, wouldn't you agree? By the way, when God says bad company corrupts good morals, does God know something about us? Well, not me. Not me. I'm, I'm so strong. I can be around a bunch of rotten people, and, and, uh, and, and there are such a thing as rotten people. I can be around them, and it won't impact me whatsoever. I'm not saying you shouldn't reach out to lost people, but you do it as a part of cord of three strands, strong enough that you've got relationships so that from that you can reach out to lost people to bring them to where you are. You don't have good, strong relationships, and you reach out into a terrible environment. You will start to pick up things that... that uh, they're doing. I, I go away on a wrestling trip for the weekend and hear the old language and words start coming to my mind that I haven't said for years just from being around it. He says, a good friend, together you get a better return. He goes on. Listen to what he says next. He says, uh, uh, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If, and then he says this, if either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. So he says, um, hey, by the way, it says if anyone falls, literally it, it's the, the, the better meaning here in the, in the language is when somebody falls. How many of you have fallen spiritually, made mistakes the rest of you are liars. <laughs> when you fall, pity the man who has no one to help them up. Well, I don't need to tell anybody. I just tell Jesus. I just tell Jesus that he's supposed to help me up. Jesus says yes, but he often uses people. In fact, he said here that a man who is alone is not being wise. In fact, in fact, Proverbs 18.1 in the original language says, says that a man who isolates himself quarrels against all sound wisdom. The scripture here is very clear. He says, hey, uh, when you fall down, pity that man. He has no one to help him up. Now, that, that's an important concept. You need people around you to help you up when you get off course and you stumble or you're not paying attention and you fall. He goes on. He says, uh, also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Uh, he's using it back in those days. You know, Israel is right outside of uh, uh, Israel is a desert, a, a wilderness area. And, you know, if you're in the Middle East, you know about hot with lack of water. And he's, he's not talking about sex here. He's talking about body heat in the middle of the night when it's super cold. And, and it's really an analogy for this. There is the cold night of the soul. When, when somebody is fallen and you can't help them up, you can't fix it, so what do you do? You lie down next to them and you walk through it with them. In, in our services, even in this service, I know there are some people that are here that have a husband or a wife or a child who has got a sickness that you wish you could, you would, you would even take it for them if you could. And you can't. And you can't get them back up on their feet. So what, is it, what does a good friend do? in the cold night of the soul, lays down right next to him and says, I'll go through it with you. You're not alone. There is the cold night of the soul. 
when you don't know what to do with a kid who's far away from God and hurting themselves. I've experienced that. And there's nothing you can do. You can't choose for them. They won't let you. And so, I, I, I don't know about you guys, but I, again, I, I personally would take it for them if I could. But I can't. To have people in your life Again, yes, if you're married, that, that, that's supposed to be what happens in marriage too, but it's not only supposed to be what happens in marriage too. He goes on. He says, if two lie down together, they will keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? Then there's this one. The one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. So, so now he's talking about you have an enemy. You have an enemy. And by yourself, you'll be overpowered. Now, I, I want to say something about this that I think is important. Um, that enemy doesn't always have to be something on the outside. My biggest wrestling matches, my biggest fights are often between my ears. There's an enemy, the devil, my flesh, frustration, and I'm fighting, but I'm fighting the wrong way or the wrong person, or I might even be wrong. And, and the Bible is very clear that a good friend, rather than affirming sin, is courageous enough and loves enough that walks in and says, Jim, you're wrong here. The Bible says wounds of a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. A true friend loves you so much that, that when you're doing something that's going to hurt you or someone else, they're courageous enough to come in and say something that may be hurtful to you, but is actually the motive behind it is to protect you, to stop you from hurting yourself. I love this, this passage in Psalm 141, verse 5. Listen to this. Let a righteous man strike me. That is a kindness. Let him rebuke me, that is oil on my head. My head will not refuse it. To have the kinds of friends that stand against you because they love you, not out of pride or arrogance or judgment, but because of caring for you. I, I, listen, I can't tell you how many times I've had friends that were willing to tell me the truth and it was, it was scary for them because in this world, if somebody tells you that you tell somebody the truth, then all of a sudden they're off the list. They're, you're off the island. You, you know? And so to love you so much that they're willing to be thrown off the island, but, but because they care about you, they will come and look you in the eye and say, I love you. And I'm not trying to push your flesh buttons by the way I'm saying this. But something's going on. A good friend fights for the good of their friend, even if the friend is the one who is off course. That's what a friend looks like. That's what a friend does. Have you ever have you had somebody tell you the truth and you just wrote them off? They're not my friend. You, you've embraced the wrong definition of a friend. If their heart was good and for you, and they had the courage to come and say something to you, you ought to at least go, man, I may not agree with you, and, but I thank you for caring about me enough that you would do something that's really hard and scary. That's the kind of friends I want to have. A good friend 
fights for you. And, and, and when, when, when maybe you've got an outside enemy, it, it, that good friend doesn't go, hey, everybody on this side is against that one guy, and if I go stand next to him, all of them are not going to like me, uh, you know, at work or wherever else. But the question is, what is right? What is good? And a friend is made for adversity. Therefore, I will stand with them. I will love them, even if, if it's unpopular, even if it means I lose my job. If he's willing to stand on doing what's right, and he's got an enemy who's attacking, I will step in beside him and be his friend, even if it means there's only two of us. That's what courage looks like, folks. A friend is there in the fight. A friend fights for relationship. When there's a, as I'm looking through this list, this is what a perfect friend looks like. And I can look at this and I can go, man, I've had friends who meant well but didn't do it right. I've meant well and didn't do it right. Sometimes I didn't even mean well. Relationship is not easy when you have a sin nature. They have a sin nature. There's confusion. There's the devil. A good friend fights for relationship, and they don't give up, and they don't just take off and run away and move, and they, they get in there, and, and we know that, that the enemy comes against relationship. He hates it. He hates us to have relationship with God and with other people who love the Lord, and so he's going to attack that relationship. He's going to divide and, and, and fill in the gaps, create gaps and fill in the gaps with lies and assumptions and no, I'm going to fight for this kind of friendship. And I want people that will fight for this kind of relationship in my life. Well, there's some things that I want to kind of bring to a close here. There's some assumptions about this passage that are really important that we need to embrace. First, there are a lot of people that go, okay, I, I don't have those kind of friends. I want those kind of friends. And... and uh, and, and I would say this, um, you want to have those kinds of friends, I think the first thing you need to do is be that kind of friend. A lot of people are, 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 are you know, I tried to be in friendship and they weren't good friends and so therefore I'm out, I'm isolated, and when you isolate yourself, you just did the enemy's work for them. He loves to get you isolated, so it's just you in your head. And uh, he, can, he can distort the truth, and he can, and it, I can't tell you how many times I've had good friends draw out of me what was in my head, and as soon as it came out of my mouth, I went, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. <laughs> and it sounded so good in my head. What do you do? You're, you become that kind of friend. And, and, and guess what? When you become that kind of friend, you're going to find out a couple of things. You still make mistakes because the only person who is that kind of friend all the time is Jesus. If you have the expect, expectation of a friend to be Jesus other than Jesus, you will always be disappointed. And if you have the expectation that you're going to be this kind of friend all the time, you will disappoint yourself. A couple of things. You want to be this kind of friend, but, but in so trying to be this kind of friend and have these kind of relationships, forgiveness is required. The only way fallible people can be in relationship with each other is if they get good at forgiveness. Secondly, when you're thinking about this kind of relationship, it requires proximity time. It, requir it doesn't happen like when we were little, you know, and we had all summer to hang out uh, with our best friends. You know, we spent the night at each other's house, and we talked all day and walked. All Relationship for adults gets difficult because you have life happening. Would you agree? It takes time. It's not going to happen immediately. You're going to have to press in. You're going to have to shape your life in such a way that you make time. It doesn't just happen. 
The reason this guy in Ecclesiastes is all alone is because he allowed his work and his wealth to dictate his time. To have friends, you're going to have to say no to certain things, even good things that are not the best things, so that you can have relationships. You're going to have to be honest. Honest. When the person fell down, the other person knew about it. Well, maybe he was, he was in close proximity enough to uh, see it, so he noticed it, and he, and he went and helped you up. But we have to be honest with one another. We have to share. That's why the Bible talks about confessing your sins one another, carrying one another's burdens. You have to share it. You have to be honest about it instead of putting on a face all the time and acting like everything's okay. It's, you have to be on and reach out. They can't know what's going on if you don't tell them. Can't tell you how many times I've had guys in my group and I have a wife call me on the phone and say something like, uh, I, my husband is in your group and you are a terrible disciple maker, Jim Putman, because he's not changing at all. This is what's going on. And I, I go, well, I, I may not be the greatest disciple maker, but your husband's in my group, and I ask him every single week, how's he doing? And he says, fine. You have to be honest. You have to be open. That's what the Bible is. We're friends. We're, we're, we have relationship with each other. We share. It's koinonia. When we're weak and struggling, we're open. When we failed, we confess it. Folks, it's, it's my prayer that you get that God wants you to have relationship, that you get that the devil doesn't. It's my prayer that you, when it comes to life group this year and your men's groups and your small groups, you'll start to go, I'm, I, I'm, I'm getting in there. I want you to know that your, your children were built for relationship, and many children leave the church most never to return, the nation statistics tell us, 80%. Why? Well, because the church doesn't have relational ropes. It's just something these parents go to when they have time. And then they get mad. They bounce around from church to church instead of showing their children what fighting for relationship and building relationship looks like and staying in there and building a community of people that have relational ropes that that stick when the wind and and the rain comes. It's our job to have these relationships and show our kids what they look like when there's a problem and you face it, when there's a mistake and you forgive it, when you did something wrong and you confess it, when there's tension, you're like, no, we're getting together and we're, we're going to figure this out. When you start showing them what that, what that looks like, they start picking it up and they go, that's the kind of relationships I got to have. But it starts with you. It's my prayer that you get in, that you say, you know what, I got plenty of things to do, but I'm going to start building these relationships for my good, for the good of others. In a group, it might not always be good for you, but we're not just caring about us. What do I get out of it? No, sometimes you are a good friend and it carries them through the dark night of the soul. through the battle that they're facing. Folks, this is what we're supposed to be known for. This is what we're, this is the, when you're following Jesus, we have a new set of goals. We're being recreated in Christ. We have a new way of looking at life and relationship as at the dead center of the bullseye of that change. I pray we grow in that. As we take communion today, We're reminded that God showed us what friendship looks like. He wants to be our friend. And he he sent God the Son down here to die on the cross for us to show us what it looks like and to rebuild relationship, reconciliation with God that started the chain of events that makes us better in relationship with people. Communion is the center of that. Jesus the Christ, our model, our Savior, our King. Thank you, Lord, for the day.
Thank you for this truth that you've given us in your word. You're right. We need it. Help us, Lord, pursue it. In Jesus' name, amen.